next talk will be by professor c balaji so professor c balaji is currently the tt narayan tenshi professor in the department of mechanical engineering at iit madras so he obtained his phd from iit madras in 1995 in the area of heat transfer and thermal sciences he has over 28 years of experience in teaching and research and he has published extensively in international journals and has undertaken several sponsored research projects for the government and industry he is a recipient of the humboldt fellowship of germany young faculty recognition award of iit madras professor ken sidaramu award uh, and medal for excellence in heat transfer research swarna jayanti fellowship of the government of india the tamil nadu scientist award and the mid career research award at iit madras in 2015 he is an elected fellow of the indian national academy of engineering he is the author of 13 books including six textbooks three monographs and two motivational books on teaching and research okay so the title of my talk is thermal Man management of ev batteries we started this work a few years ago of course we have been in the business of heat transfer for I mean three decades now so uh, uh, so this organized in this way first we'll just look at introduction and then bdm or bdms using phase change material that's what so our specialization is in phase change material um, we also looked at something interesting how to use the inverse heat transfer to actually do some work in battery thermal management and uh, of course how how do we use machine learning so machine learning is big time now how to use machine learning in uh, uh, predicting temperatures for optimal thermal control and so on and scope for fu future work okay so so this is basically from some literature which is well known so the transportation sector is res responsible for about 20% of the global co2 emissions and uh, road transportation is the largest contributor so evs have emerged as a promising solution to the global challenge of climate change of course there are a lot of debates about it some people will say that hydrogen will be the uh, fuel of the future some people are saying that ammonia engines will be the fuel of the future and some companies like maruti suzuki have already invested heavily in hybrids so they are saying hybrid hybrids will be the intermittent solution and so on so long term we really don't know the electric vehicles are the solution and so on but uh, man is a man is very smart as a species so we'll eventually find some solution suddenly some solution will appear from nowhere and let's hope for the let's hope for that solution so the government of india has been targeting at least 70% of commercial cars 30% of private cars 40% of buses and 80% of two and three wheelers to be electric vehicles by 2030 leading to a large reduction in co2 emission and so on europe is already quite advanced in electric vehicles and so on i think you know the norway the, the, they are all so they're going to completely face out uh, ice huh? internal combustion engine so uh, so <laughs> they are there's a lot of talk but india is going to take a long time all right anyway so an electric vehicle battery uh, also known as a traction battery a battery can be ca categorized either as a primary metal air or a secondary recha rechargeable battery primary batteries uh, like metal air offer one time use while secondary batteries we can recharge them all right so so in simple english is a battery is a transducer that converts chemical energy into electrical energy and vice versa this is basically the charging and discharging so it has got french and uh, uh, latin origins and finally the english word battery means a device that stores electrical energy Okay, so Benjamin Franklin was the first who coined the term battery to describe an array of charge plates. So, because it has resemblance to the military formation of cannons in the 16th century. All right, so this is the historical perspective, the timeline from Galvani's frog-leg experiment, which we have studied in high school, to the commercial lithium-ion cell and so on. So, so there's a there's a big journey now, right? So, the first commercial lithium-ion cell was in 1991 by Sony Corporation. All right, so. Why are lithium-ion batteries popular? So this view graph will tell you. The cartoon on the northeast corner of the slide will tell you uh, the gravimetric energy density versus volumetric energy density. You can see that lithium-ion batteries are scoring the, what is indicated in green color, encompassed in a circle. Shows you that lithium-ion lithium batteries are quite promising. So lithium, lithium is the lightest of all metals. So it has got such a 
it is a magic uh, material in the sense that you got low atomic number and it is a metal and so on. So, it rubs shoulders with uh, hydrogen and uh, helium which are gases right. So, once you see it is a metal you think it is a high molecular weight and so on. So, this is like a dream material in that sense right. High gravimetric and volumetric energy density, it has got a great electrochemical potential. So, less discharge and uh, good spread of thermal range all right. But of course, there is, uh, there is no dream material which will I mean which is the be all and end all of everything. So, it is accompanied by a host of problems, it is too much instituted to very cold temperatures. There is a issue of the fading of capacity with time, high internal resistance of course, the cost is very high. All right. So, there is a gamut of applications in which uh, lithium ion uh, uh, cells can be, batteries can be used. So, I will give this, I will leave this slide with you later on so that it is quite busy, right. All right. So, how does a lithium ion battery work? This is a very simple this thing, um, I do not have to explain this to this audience. So, there is a uh, cathode, anode and a cathode and then you have got a uh, separator. So, there is a metal oxide which is indicated in blue color and so. So, this is the charging and discharging, I do not know, maybe I have to run it, uh, ah, okay. I think you got it, all right. Okay. Why do lithium ion batteries generate heat? heat? Why can't they just keep quiet, so that we do not have to worry about cooling? They just, so many problems are solved. Unfortunately, they will generate heat, largely because of three reasons. There is something called the polarization heat, the reversible entropic heat and there is a ohmic heating. Let us come to ohmic heating, all of us are very familiar with this. Heat generated due to the internal resistance offered by the battery to the flow of electrons, that is, that is taken, that is given, all right. The reversible entropic heat is during discharge, heat will be generated because of the exothermic reaction which is taking place. There is also a polarization heat or ionic migration heat which is basically because of the activation polarization and concentration polarization and the threshold energy required to initiate the reaction is called activation polarization. So, lithium ions have a very low diffusion coefficient. So, some energy has to be spent on lithium ions to overcome the concentration gradient. So, there is some heating which is occurring because of this, okay. So, the need for thermal management. So, so let us look at the left, top left end of the view of this view graph. So, of this slide, the heat generation, reaction heat, polarization heat, joule heat. So, temperature rise above, si above 60 degrees is deadly. So, the rise in reaction rate is can cause electrolyte break breakdown, damage to the separator, short circuit and rapid discharge. So, it is a vicious cycle, heat generation, term, temperature rise, thermal runaway, increase reaction rate. So, it will get into a spin, right. So, this is like a domino effect which is indicated there, okay. So, we, we have so recently have, we have been seeing news items of how electric uh, uh, scooters are catching fire and particularly when they are uh, charging at home or something and then so. So, I think maybe there are, we do not, we, we still do not have standard for testing, this thing and all that. So, India the infrastructure has, we do not have a national level standard for qualification of batteries and all that. So, I think slowly it will come. So, so there is a need for thermal management, okay. So, the global automotive battery thermal management system is expected to grow uh, to 4.5 billion US by 2027. Recent trends in the battery thermal management system, the, the simplest and uh, do not don't do nothing or do not do anything will be the natural convection. But you know the, hum, the fluxes which can, uh, it is a noiseless and the, uh, noiseless and safe, but only for a particular, only up to a certain level of heat flux. Then you can go for forced air cooling. Then uh, ethylene glycol is the industry standard. Then you go to ethylene glycol and you have a battery pack and so on. Then when there are peak loads, we may have to look for heat pipes, pulse heating, it will phase change materials and so on. So, whether you want to design your cooling system for peak load and the peak load does not occur all the time or you want to uh, design the cooling system only for the baseline load and for these peaks, you will have on some technologies like the heat pipe or the PCM which will be chipping in and so on. So, there will be a mix and match strategy where there is, uh, you do not look at a one shoe size fits all kind of approach, okay. So, air cooling, enhanced air flow design using topology optimization, another other optimization technique. So, there is a tremendous scope for optimization here, geometric optimization, thermal optimization and so on, vapor chamber cooling and so on, liquid cooling, immersion cooling, integrated cooling plates with optimized dimensions and so on. So, PCMs, uh, 
see PCM, PCM, PCM. I also work a lot in PCM. I mean, so many of my students have graduated, but uh, we have to understand that eventually the heat has to be taken away only by radiation or con convection. PCM is basically a it is a thermal flywheel, it will just absorb the shock. So, then what do you do? After it has to cool, otherwise it cannot be reused. Therefore, it is not such a dream solely PCM, PCM, we have to understand that you have to take it to the pinch of salt. The PCM has to be aligned to some other cooling. Basically, eventually the heat has to go only through water or air. Whatever you do, you can turn upside down. It has to go to the water or it has to go to the ambient or it has to go to outer space. This is the thing, whatever heat transfer you do, finally it is this. So, all this is we are, we are creating additional paths for which heat will flow, heat will flow seamlessly, effortlessly, more efficiently, whatever, okay. So, that is what, so all our heat transfer coefficient H, we want to increase, boiling, this thing, all that basically, basically, basically because we are not able to reach that H, we are not able to re get isothermal heat transfer, which is a given in your course on thermodynamics, we will say isothermal heat transfer, all thermodynamics process will say, please show me sir. <laughs> Please show me, I will fall at your feet. Yeah, I mean, the heat transfer is uh, considered as a, I always, heat transfer is considered such a poor cousin in the course of thermodynamics. They say, they say uh, 500 kilojoule is, uh, is given in. Please tell me how to give it. <laughs> so, because man was, I always keep saying, man was obsessed with converting heat to work, heat to work, heat to work, heat to work. Okay. Yeah, I mean, so because uh, the only goal of life is to basically, convert heat to work so that human, hey, array, there are many other things where some, some heat is generated, okay, lot of heat can be generated without doing any work at all, <laughs> even in life. Huh? So, <laughs> so the basic idea is just get out of that, this thing, even when there is no conversion, even there is no heat engine, so, many, so we, we have to continuously remove heat in this place, nobody is running a turbine or a, uh, this thing here, right. So, there are so many situations where you want the temperature to be under control, you want optimal thermal comfort, right? You want something to work at a specific temperature or you want heat to be removed or you just want heat to be added. So, the original idea of heat as one of the two interactions which occur as a system boundary such that low grade energy can be converted into work and all that is, that is there. But apart from that, we have to look at other situations where heat transfer as an independent e existence, right, in its own right, okay. So, PCMs also, we, have to, we should not get carried away by PCM, PCM and all that, right. PCM can uh, take the peak load, all right. Okay, types of cooling techniques, this is a battery pack, you can have a forced air cooling or you can have a forced uh, liquid cooling, ethylene glycol. So, nowadays I think even ma massive focus on TAFE has got tractors, there are tractors in India which are fully electric. Hmm? So, then you can have a heat sink, then you can have a heat pipe and a cold plate. So, the first work I am going to talk about is uh, with the thermal management 1860, 1860 lithium ion battery using novel fins, PCM and expanded graphite composite heat sinks. This is Rajesh Akula who is now a postdoc in IIT Bombay Energy Science Engineering, all right. So, the performance of a heat sink mainly depends on the properties of the working fluid, the choice of fin material and fin design. Okay. So, the working fluid, all, all of us want to have some dream fluid, which will have high thermal conductivity, high specific heat and uh, high latent heat. Okay. Whenever you talk about dream fluid and this thing and all that, God, nature, they do not like all that. So, you will have a, it will always come as a package, it will come with a mixture of good and bad, all right. So, and PCMs are notorious for the low thermal conductivity. So, therefore, you will have to, you will have to supplement that with, uh, but you should have uh, heat spreaders, you will, you will have metal foam, you will have uh, fins and so on, okay. These are called TCEs, thermal conductivity enhancers, all right. So, therefore, the number two is basically what type of fin material you will use, copper or fin, then fin design and so on, all right. Okay, this is basically 18650 battery. So, there is a set point temperature. So, the set point temperature is safe temperature, okay. You do not want the device to go beyond that. So, as Professor has already shown, so this is this curve is something which will keep on coming when you look at PCM. So there is a sensible heat, there is a latent heat, there is again a sensible heat. So the game is played. The, you are able to play the game for so that you can play cricket. First, ground is required, right? There, sh there should be a ground. Otherwise, road in India we use the road also the ground, but some medium is required, right? Just like uh, water or air is required for heat transfer, you need to play. So 
you are able to play the game of PCM basically because of this. There is a high latent heat, okay. But once that latent heat is crossed, it goes into this, it behaves or misbehaves like any other, any other medium, okay. So the ability to extract, so you are, uh, it is game on when you are in this region, all right, okay. So there you can, so you can come out with uh, what is the expected operating temperature of your device and then you can pick and choose your PCM. Now there is a lot of uh, materials and chemistry is also possible. You can have alkane um, binary mixture, you can mix two things 20 percent, 80 percent, 60 percent, 40 percent based on different melting point. Then to augment this you can use fins and if this is not sufficient you can use a heat pipe, you can use a pulsating heat pipe or what have you stuff. And then once you keep on adding more and more devices the reliability will re reduce the cost will also increase so there will be a trade off. There is no point in, uh, no point in I want to do waste heat recovery, add exhaust gas, this thing, this thing, thermoelectric generator, all that. So it is a uh, law, of, law of diminishing marginal uti utility, that is what they say in economics, all right. So uh, the key advantage is increased operating time. So if you have a melting, if you, if you are able to exploit the latent heat, you uh, the key metric, the key weapon you have in your hands is basically the increased operating time which is afforded by the high latent heat, all right. So the desirable property of a PCM would be a high latent heat, high specific uh, heat, high thermal conducti th thermal conductivity but the thermal conductivity is something is a sore thumb, you are not going to get it, all right. So that is why these fins and other things are used. Melting point, melting temperature should of course, needless to say the melting temperature should be below your set point temperature and then finally you want to have less volumetric expansion otherwise you will have to give lot of gap, okay. And if there is volumetric you are going to have trouble, all right. So whatever I have circled in red color basically is the issue there. Normally these materials have uh, order of 1 watt per meter per Kelvin. Therefore we need to go for these fins and other things or you can go for other materials like expanded graphite, you can use metal foams and so on. So basically this is our, so what we are doing is we put a 18650 battery or you just put something which mimics a battery and then but you have to charge it, you have to, you have to give heating to it in such a way that it actually mimics the heat produced by a battery. This basically you want to do control studies, right. So this is the setup. So we do this for 2C discharge rate, 3, 3C discharge rate and 4C discharge rate. Uh, the heat generation is a function of time. Now the, the key challenge in any battery thermal management system which confronts, which confronts a thermal engineer is basically because we start out with the, we, you, we start out, how do we actually design? Uh, if you tell a heat transfer engineer, you tell me what the heat load is. You tell me what the heat load is, I will do boiling this thing, I will do all that, I will do all that and give you the best device. I do not know the heat generation rate in a battery. The, for the, first, the first problem is that it is dynamically changing with time and if you want to get to the bottom of it, there is so much of electrochemistry involved. Unless you are good in electrochemistry, you can never get to the bottom of the problem by just being a very smart guy in heat transfer, it is not going to work. And that model of the electrochemical model is of 37, 38, 39 parameters. Each of these has its own sensitivity. Therefore, we have a problem at hand. We have a problem at hand. The heat generation is not known a priori. It is a function of time and coupled to this, if you add various driving cycles, if you are driving an autobahn, if you are driving in Chennai city, okay, anyway the speed limit does not matter because you cannot anyway, you cannot anyway, you cannot anyway go 60 or 70, all right. So if you, uh, if you uh, couple it with the driving cycle, then uh, there is lot of further optimization which is possible because you do, uh, the optimal control of the cooling system will, ch will chip in, that is what, they will, that is what the industry, the industry will be moving in this direction, all right. It is not something like I have put a fan and this thing, I have designed it for the rest of the life it will work, we do not know. And global warming after 5 degrees ambient temperature may also change, so there are lot of issues, all right. Therefore the first thing to which, we, which may surprise all of you is. Uh, for a particular discharge rate of 2C, 4C or 5C for this particular battery pack, what is the heat which will be generated? That is, your, that, that is a difficult question to answer, that is a difficult question to answer. So there are some ways of attacking this problem. So what we approach in our group is basically uh, you can make some measurements on an actual battery under various discharging conditions. 
make some temperature measurements and go to the inverse heat transfer route and solve a conjugate conduction problem okay con solve a conjugate conduction problem and then find out what will be the heat generation rate which will cause these temperatures then with that heat generation rate you just further move on to your cooling technology solution otherwise the end uh, uh, this there are many models available uh, default models which are available in uh, even in your commercial software so you have to use these electrochemical models and try to get but then you have to validate this so you have to do at least some limited set of uh, asymptotic validation or some sort of limited validation of the experiment and move forward so that is the first challenge all right so we considered pcm plus expanded graphite so after some time it actually becomes like chemistry alchemy whatever you want you try various combinations some will work some will not work and so on so obviously you have to characterize so you are at the mercy of chemistry lab instrumentation center and all that so you have to do differential scanning calorimetry to get pull out all your latent heat this thing specific heat thermal conductivity and all that. so after all these characterization so you so basically the specific heat is going like this so you have to characterize for your pure eco science so and then eco science 90% plus 10% expanded graphite 20% expanded graphite try various various types of combinations okay so you can do a systematic study where it is a plain vanilla just put a pcm just put a pcm no fins that put then just put fins no pcm just then go on adding pins plus pcm plus expanded graphite so so this uh, the research scholars will do a complete exhaust exhaustive parametric study and plots like this are very interesting so you can find out the average temperature as a function of time so so basically there is only one goal delay the inevitable what is the inevitable the set point temperature anyway it will get heated hold on boss hold on boss hold on boss that is the game here <laughs> don't get so heated so fast don't get don't get angry <laughs> cool cool you like chill okay chill bro that's what they say you know <laughs> chill bro that's what you are telling the battery but no i want chill bro i will behave according to my dharma uh, so that is the game <laughs> all right so what we do is so if you see this 2c 3c 4c one thing one thing which strikes you is, sir all the plots look similar no all the plots are oh, similar but look at the x axis is continuously decreasing with the increasing discharge rate from 4000 seconds it has come to 2000 seconds to 1500 seconds and the y axis the top is only 65 degrees centigrade so as your discharge rate increases so it stands to reason that your uh, uh, the time available for you to play the game continuously goes down all right and so we are able to so this is a plain heat sink without fins so this is a but with eco sign so this is with fins and so on so we are able to see that if you give 130 or 260 fins okay i i showed you the fins the cylinder you put on the cylinder so you can see that not much variation is seen so what is important is sometimes uh, if you look at the science of optimization so there is a technique called genetic algorithm i am very i am a big fan of genetic algorithms so david goldberg david goldberg they they started with the they said that the paradigms of optimization have to be changed because optimization as practiced by mathematicians is there is a magic there is a function called y i have to set dy by dx equal to 0 but in life in a in a heat sink where is the dy by dx what is y how can you make it as a function of so many variables uh, y should be a function and where, where you can use calculus to get the minimum or maximum does it happen in life is there a best human being yet how do you what are the attributes of the has the best human being arrived yet these are the questions these are the questions uh, because we don't know what the best is the best is highly subjective therefore the emphasis in genetic algorithm is compared to compared to the previous generations or previous iterations are you improving and then the golden rule is after you have improved to a certain level stop it don't torture further the idea of reaching the best is very elusive is it you can never reach it yeah so you say it is as elusive as the himalayan 80 the himalayan 80 is supposed to be some animal which nobody has seen right so don't try to torture and torture 0.1% anyway there is a factor of safety anyway finally when you assemble what your predictions will not match so anyway let's not get into that so that's that is the idea all right so here uh, if you if you just able to correlate what i just spoke one or two minutes ago you are saying that 130 or 260 fins don't matter at, 
they make very little difference. This is, it is exactly these kinds of solutions which engineers want. We don't want pure mathematical solutions. Uh, the length and breadth and uh, height must be 137.64 millimeter. How can you ever fabricate that? Mathematicians, I'm sorry to mathematicians will say whatever they want. <laughs> so if there are four heat sinks which will give the same performance, then, then we have to have a party, you have to celebrate. <laughs> so you see, the robustness is the key in engineering optimization. There is only one thing which will work. Nature, does, nature is not like that. Is it okay? If there is some scientist, we respect all scientists. If there is some scientist without which it, uh, we say something is indispensable, we don't know. Uh, somebody else would have found it after a few years. We are not discounting the role of anybody. It, so if, if there is a need, nature, man will find a solution somehow. Somebody will find a solution. All right? Okay. So thermal regulation, effect of PCM plus fin plus EG, all that we have done. So it's all very busy. So, but the sum and substance of all this is basically you can do this intervention. So this, this and this can be good PhD problems. Finally, you can come with a set of designs which will work reasonably well and compared to the baseline, they will be much better. All right. And all these are based on experiments. They are not based on simulations. All right. Okay. Suppose you are doing the whole optimization on a, a numerical platform. It is uh, important. It is imperative that finally you just take at least the optimum case and validate it with the experiment. All right. Okay. So then what we have done is basically we have used expanded graphite. We found that with the expanded graphite, you are able to get better performance. So it is the same thing. It is that uh, average battery temperature with uh, time. So you are able to see that these are various combinations of fins and expanded graphite and eco sine mixture. So again, we are able to get some good design solution. The key takeaway is uh, addition of expanded graphite to pure PCM eliminates intricacies involved in the design of heat sink. So the thing is, whatever is finally, whatever is finally coming in two lines, it will take about three, four years to come to this line. That is the research. <laughs> That is a statement you are making, that's it, right? So this we cannot say uh, a priori. For that, you have to do a lot of investigation. Okay. Mm. So now, uh, he, he doesn't want to give up. So actually, after some time, research scholars get fatally attracted to the door. Sir, I'll pour this, I'll pour that, I'll pour this. Okay, he said, you, do, you pour whatever you want, till, the, till some editor rejects that paper. <laughs> I'm editor myself. Huh? <laughs> Then they'll say there should not be any further papers from Balaji on the subject. <laughs> but students are carried away. Sir, I found out something new. So students, my students come. Sir, I found this. Sir, instead of 260 fins, we'll use 254 fins. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. So now, now, so some people who want to do further study in this. You can take any other pouch battery, not be, it, you can take a pouch battery, you can buy it, even if you are not heavily funded like in the IIT system, whatever. So some three or four BTEC students can take a pouch battery, you can start. Now if you want to do a full electrochemical model, it will be very difficult. There are some reduced order capacitance resistance models which you can build, but what you could do when you build this model, take some measurements in your lab under various 1C, 2C, mix and match these measurements with the reduced order model and say, with this reduced order model, I develop a thermal management solution and so on. This is like, uh, this is a low hanging fruit. Suppose a detailed electrochemical model, you require a big system, you, you require that software license and all that. So some things along this direction. So this was done basically by a uh, Nithyan, a dual degree student, all right. Okay. So, but these completely simulations, after those, after getting the reduced order model, we put this reduced order model in a in a battery thermal management solution solution where between two batteries we have put a cold plate and through the cold plate the channels are drilled where there is ethylene glycol or some water or something which is flowing. All right, this is one solution. How much more time I have? Five minutes. Five minutes. Okay. Ah. So summary of. Uh, okay. So basically battery thermal management. So there is a heat generation. So there are many cooling techniques available. PCM is one, composite PCM, all this we have done. So we'll, out, we'll also have to mitigate the, mitigate the hot spots. There could be some particular hot spots. So what you can do is once you have a validated model, 
through the experiments, you will not be able to measure temperature at so many places. So you use a validated numerical model, and the numerical model you can you can do full scale and find out where the thermal hotspots are there, so that you can redirect their cooling and other uh, cooling strategies such that this thermal strategy, thermal uh, hotspots are reduced. There's another thing. Uh, see, when you do topology optimization, there's something called thermal compliance. The thermal compliance is basically the maximum temperature anywhere. Uh, the difference between the maximum temperature and the average temperature in that square of that sigma of that. This is basically a good indicator of live reliability, thermal stresses, and so on. So you can do a compliance study for your uh, device and this thing for your battery and so on. All right. Future challenges will be future challenges in BTMS will not only be thermal, this will also be mechanical and also electrical, because mechanical and electrical abuse of the battery also lead to heat generation. All right. So. This is Suraj Kumar, who did PhD with me. He is now postdoc in IIT Delhi. Okay. So basically, the same thing what we approach is, instead of using an electrochemical model, if you take a battery or a simulated battery, okay, so you make temperature measurements at a few places. Okay. Then you have a conjugate conduction model. Then can you pull out the Kx, Ky, Kz, anisotropic thermal conductivity and the Cp. Now with this Kx, Ky, uh, Kz and Cp, you put it into your electrochemical model or any other model or and then actually find out what will be the heat will be generated. How do you find out the heat which will be generated? What you do is, so first you have to characterize the material. Okay. So to characterize the material, he gave a known heat supply. He gave a known heat supply and this vacuum chamber, we all fully instrumented, fully instrumented and we, we, we did temperature measurements. With these temperature measurements, what you do is, okay. Experiments on the active material of the lithium ion battery. Get the experimental temperature. Run an inverse model. What is this inverse model? So you simulate the uh, you simulate an active battery with with all your thermal conductivities and Cp. This is the characterization, thermal char characterization with guess values of the parameters. Generate the temperatures. Compare the measured temperatures. Compare the measured temperatures with the simulated temperatures. Use whatever framework you want. So I have a fancy for Bayesian probabilistic approach. So we use the Marco Metropolis Hastings Markov chain Monte Carlo. With that, we'll find out which combination of Kx, Kx, Kr, K theta, Kz, and Cp gives the best match with your experiment. So that is the solution to this problem. Once you get this Kx, Kv, Kz, what you do is now, now conduct experiments on the lithium ion battery for various discharge rates. Okay. Now you already have you already have all this because with known heat with known heat generation rate you generated you did experiments and you got all this. Now you put a guess value of the heat generation, generate the temperatures. Now find out which value of the heat generation will match. Therefore, it's a divide and conquer. The first part you take the QV as known. With known QV, you characterize the material. Second, once you characterize the material, do measurements on the battery. Pull out the QV. Once you have the pull out, once you pull out the QV, what is a big deal? There is no need to use the electrochemical model further. Without the electrochemical model, as a pure heat transfer problem, you can solve the problem. This is not the approach. This is uh, this is an approach or a approach, whatever to the problem. So there are multiple ways of looking at this problem. But you have to get over to this difficulty of this electrochemical model somehow. So. I have told you three strategies to handle battery thermal management. First is get down to the whole hog, solve the electrochemical model fully. That is one. But you need to validate it because it has got so many parameters, number one. Number two, have a reduced order model with some measurements. Third, use a very elaborate inverse approach and completely get rid of the electrochemical model. At the end of all this, what do you want to know? What is QV as a function of time? That is not known. That is not easy. He transfer the problem is you tell me what is Q, I'll give you the best hedge. But that game is no longer on in battery thermal management. Okay. All right. So this is uh, anyway the message is conveyed, and no work nowadays is complete unless you do this. Right? The paper will not get removed. <laughs> <laughs> so, <yeah. laughs> well, so you have to some some input, some output. This thing neural network. Everybody has a fancy for neural network, and in your CV it has to say you know machine learning and. Uh, all right. So, ah. so this is how the Kx varies its temperature, Ky varies. So this is so this is how we have characterized the system. And finally, this is ah, ah, this is a big. So it's a lot of work. 
So he was very good in mathematics, so right. So you obviously you can see there's heavy mathematics involved. So to be able to guess this form itself is very difficult. How do you guess this form? So that is a separate story. We can take the discussion offline. All right. So yes, actually done the experiment for heat generation. Then we solve this. So this QV is unknown. So you put guess values of QV, solve the problem, match with the experiments, then pull out the QV. Okay. And for that, again, a set of neural network and all that, right? We have done that. So this is basically, this is how you get a result from the Bayesian approach. There is no single answer to the problem. Every answer is possible, but some answers like this are unlikely. Do you understand? So this is the probabilistic approach to parameter estimation. All right. Ah, so this is a separate, the Bayesian method. All right. So finally, what you do is you'll have to compare your temperature, experimental temperatures, simulated temperatures, and they should agree reasonably well. All right. Okay. So this last, uh, this is uh, Danvir Raj. Uh, he did dual degree <coughs> with, with us. So what we did was actually we took a so basically battery thermal management, this is actually practical problem. We took the, there's a University of Wisconsin Madison publicly available data set for various driving cycles for various US highways, this thing and all that. You take the data set, it'll give you temperatures a function of time. What is the funda? The funda now is uh, with the with the past experiment, with the past data of the battery temperature, can you predict the battery temperature for the next 30 seconds? No physics model, no Navier-Stokes, nothing. Just brute force, I mean just machine learning and all that. So there's a very powerful technique called LSTM, long short term memory. There is a long term memory, there is also a short term memory, it will mix and match how much of short term memory, the last 5 seconds or 10 seconds or 20 seconds memory it will use and then using this database last 2-3 minutes what has happened or whatever, so, the, so there's an encoder, decoder, there is a big uh, this thing going on inside. So with that you can actually predict the temperatures for the next 30 seconds, but suddenly there is a change in the cycle or something, this neural network will get stuck. So we'll have to work, we'll have to work around all these things. And also, this is only simulation, this has to be experimentally validated and so on. But LSTM is big time. For example, uh, monsoon prediction and so on, LSTM will be very useful. Uh, LSTM is uh, for stock prices, how will the nifty, how will the nifty go in the next 10, 15 days? So basically look at the, Long, long term memory of Nifty and the short term memory of Nifty and mix and match. This is how they make money, right? So, if you're good in neural network, you will also be good in finance. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, that's it. Oh, as the professor has said, the smart cooling system. So, smart cooling system is the technology of the future. So, you should be, the cooling system should be able to dynamically adapt itself so that it optimally uses the cooling system so that you get the best performance, all right? Uh, so this is uh, not so easy. So there will be a lot of electronics also here. So there will be a lot of electronics and this thing, so computers and so on, all right? So future challenges, uh, thermal management in three major abuse conditions. Thermal abuse, mechanical abuse, electrical abuse. So mechanical abuse and electrical abuse, basically from internal resistance, it leads to heat generation, this lead, leads to a host of accidents right therefore it is imperative that we seek the most appropriate thermal management solution okay these are some of the group members some of them are here also uh, so all the work which is generated in my lab comes from the students i rarely write single author papers so without students we are nobody all right we just talk thank you very much <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Uh, is that fin materials is added with uh, graphite materials or uh, inside the uh, a jacket and inside it is the inside the PCM. Inside the PCM. Inside the PCM. Okay. Got it. Uh, yeah. So they have also done some You have done EEG? No. You know that. Fine. If you have a metal form, yeah, uh, uh. yeah, yeah, uh, correct. It will go into the, ah, uh, correct. Yes. Okay. 
Uh, the thing is, uh, while doing alone PCM, uh, conducting experiment, uh, the leakage is the main headache. <coughs> <coughs> leakage. Ah. So, for that uh, we have used some uh, adhesives, but uh, any material uh, which is not, uh, means uh, anti-resistance uh, of leakage kind of material. <coughs> but we didn't have any leakage issue so far. I'm is there any leakage issue? No, no, in actual practice, you did for the heat sink, uh, actually. That uh, uh, mimic of the model you did, sir. But actual case. Actual uh, case of what? Uh, actual battery. No, we are have used, but uh, we didn't uh, encounter any leak so far. Uh, is leakage is a problem, actually, what I am uh, conducting experiment. I and uh, I rectified that uh, this thing, and I used some adhesives, some uh, company's uh, adhesives. What is the temperature uh, level? Uh, 150, 60 only, right? Uh, yeah, 150 uh. only. But still, uh, uh, at that time it was leakage, and uh, after that I uh, rectified that. I you can uh, talk to me, students, room number, heat transfer lab, get it okay, get sir, some okay. time. They will show you. And okay, sir. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Uh, uh, one of the problem, that's what. Okay, thank you. Active cooling is very important. Uh, uh. This is over and above. So, uh, if you look at all these tractors, if you look at ethylene glycol, yeah. ethylene glycol is a workhorse. And that is a workhorse of the industry. I mean, so, uh. Sir, one question on the other side. So, you are talking about temperature of the battery cooling and so Martin has said you have low temperatures and lower. So, when you go to the, like, the lower limit, uh, what can PCMs do actually be like, No, lower limit, India everywhere is upper limit. I don't worry. <laughs> so, you may be from cryogenic, your worry is some other thing. Huh? So you deal with it separately. <laughs> 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 so what you're dealing with is not India's problem. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it is ISRO's problem. <laughs> 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 of course, ISRO's problem is India's problem. <laughs> 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 yeah, that range is a problem. So you have to have some uh, additives or something to uh, something will be there. Okay. Chemists are good, so they have solutions to many of this. You have to talk to them. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Ah. So, for this cold climate, much India is not much minus degree centigrade, but uh, various in diversity in the climate change for different states, uh, around 5 degrees somewhere else, and other day, say 25 degrees centigrade. If you talk about the 5 degree cooling temperature, at that time we can use the PCM uh, thickness matters, what thickness we are maintaining inside that system. Okay. Thickness of the PCM is. That's what, that is we have to select a uh, range of uh, PCM temperature. We'll discuss later on that. Power generation or heat generation, uh, given the temperature, you know, I want to know if uh, in a realistic battery, you know, the heat generation is non-uniform. So, suppose you take the cylindrical cell or a pouch cell, the uh, source uh, of uh, you know maximum heat is distributed maybe close to the electrodes. In, ta in a pouch cell, it's more towards the taps. So, in that uh, kind of circumstance, uh, you know, having a mock heater and predicting the heat generation and using it uh, to actually design the cooling system, <coughs> will it uh, probably either underestimate or over overestimate your cooling performance because you are not looking at the local distribution of heat yeah. and where the hot spots are and how yeah, do you Yeah, so this is, the uh, this is alpha version. So what you can do basically is, I don't see this much, uh, this thing, if a cylindrical battery, uh, azimuthal variation you can neglect. So, but radial and, uh, so you can actually put QV as a function of RZ and time. So th the inverse problem gets more and more complicated. Uh, mm. But it, it is doable, it is doable. So but you require more data, more uh, measurement. Yeah. Mm. So I'm saying it is one strategy. Otherwise, you use measurements to fine-tune the model parameters in LGTK. What, what model is that? NTGK model. So you just uh, fine-tune the parameters of that model. Otherwise, it's just a black box. It is just uh, solving some, uh, uh, what is it, Maxwell's equation. Something it is solving and then. Uh, I would say the basic bottleneck is even if you want to use the ECM models. The thermal conductivity of uh, the uh, the um, cell is having an anisotropic thermal conductivity. So that's what please so please yeah. use inverse. So that is something which, which we don't know as. Ah, so you can use problem. inverse. So 
So basically, see, uh, we have to use an intelligent combination of measurements, models, and see the whole uh, the Bayesian inference. The there is a big, there is something which mechanical engineers often miss. There is something called prior information, prior knowledge. You don't have to search for thermal conductivity in the range zero to infinity. So the Bayesian is, it is likely to be between 10 and 20 with a peak of around 15. Then you can give, you can give a probabilist probabilistic uh, distribution to the prior. And then, so we can exploit that. So that possibility is there. So it is not a helter-skelter search where you search uh, exhaustively in the domain. We do have prior knowledge of many parameters and quantities. Uh -huh. Sir, as you said about the electrochemical models, sir, in the ANSYS student software, we have different models, as you said, that NTGK, uh -huh. MSMD models. Sir, uh, if you do not have an experimental setup, then we uh, model it uh, using the electrochemical models available in Fluent software and get the temperature variations. Yeah, but first <coughs> validate it. Yeah, yeah, after uh -huh. validation. Uh, after getting the temperature variations, sir, if we carry out the effect and cause relationship, because inverse heat transfer means we have the effect and we have to find out the cause. No, if you are already using the NTGK model, where is the inverse? So no, we have to check no whether the inverse... No, that inverse is not... Oh. That inverse is not in that context. Okay. Sir. This is just you are checking whether it is. A, so if it is not matching, what will you do? Okay, sir. Th then how could <laughs> you say that the because you don't have an, you okay. don't have an accompany physics model where okay. there is something which you can change. All right. Sir. Otherwise, what you should do is I agree with what is. Suppose there are model parameters into in that model. Hmm. You have to change these model parameters. Each then if you put a combination of these model parameters, it will give an output. You need a reference measurement, your own measurement to compare. Otherwise, what will you compare with? Okay, so sir. you can never do an inverse problem unless you have your own measurements. Okay, sir. Mm. Right, sir. I was just asking that if we could uh -huh. get that temperature variations from the numerical results, and after we have the numerical results of the temperature variations, right? So no, that, that is, is a, anyway. That is okay. already use the model. Okay. No, sir. We have to use the temperature variations for that inverse model. Yeah, uh, but the temperature variations uh, came from your uh, the other model. So. Okay, sir. Yeah, I got it. Sir. Where is uh, where are you sitting? I'm sitting next to him. Where is he sitting? He's sitting next to me. That circularity is not removed. Correct? You are not. So there is no benchmark for you. To, you are just moving in circles. Mm. Ah. Yeah. Yeah. Pallab. Yeah. Yes. Sir, how uh, physics-based models are important for this type of problems? What is that? Like say in the reinforcement learning or something like that. Yeah, but Le see, we are actually using uh, you are actually using um, measured data. So Le any like model particularly what Arvind no, asked about the non uniformity I, I, I got your question. Things like that. Yeah. See, any model, any model is a mathematical abs uh, mathematical abstraction of the way we understand. Okay. So, so fundamentally, just because Newton taught us, it doesn't mean that that is the only physics model. Sometimes these anti-machine learning people are just hung up on that. How are we sure that uh, we, we assume so many things, continuum, this thing, all that, okay? So my take on that would be slightly different. When you're using measured data, the measured data has already embedded the physics, whether you're in Navier stocks, all that is your problem, my problem. The data behaves according to its dharma. It has already satisfied this law. What these laws, what these equations is, is for us to figure out. So if it is heavily based on the data, then, uh, it is already physics. Physics is there. Why are you saying it is not physics divorced? It is there. It is there. It is. It is coming out of measurements. Measurements are not coming out from nowhere. It is sat Then you try to do an abstraction of the system with your model. That is why. See, any time something new comes, there will be resistance, right? It is like that. But what you have to do is, but there are a lot of C. These models will not give you all the details. This neural network, it may just give you prediction of temperature. But you want to do other things. You want to really study a hot spot. Then you have to go back to your Navier-Stokes equation, energy equation, and so on. So what we have to do is, you have to embrace. We have to embrace newer technologies as they come. While you are em embracing this, let us not divorce the physics-based model. Everything has to be used in tandem. So wherever it is advantageous. So if it is just the time series which you want to predict, why do you want to solve a DNS or LES or uh, you just de uh, uh, time series of one particular temperature, then a uh, uh, reduced model should be fine. Ah.
so now we have a short tea break till uh, 11:15 and the next section starts by at 11:15